guys and welcome to episode 205 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode I interviewed Dr. John Grayson. John has been on the podcast a couple times before so it's great to get him on again. And in it he is also joined by Sarah who is one of his clients and we talk about a theme called OCD staring. Now this isn't something I've talked about on the podcast before or I don't even believe has come up on the podcast so hopefully this episode can shed some light on this particular theme and help those who it affects or is affected by it. Um, so in it we go into what is OCD staring, we get Sarah's story, her experience of this particular theme of OCD, the treatment for it, idea how to explain it to others if that's something you wanted to do, um, what's helped Sarah, words of hope and much much more. Um, so it's the first time I've done a therapist and a client together so hopefully that's interesting to you and hopefully you find this episode useful. In our chat John and Sarah mention a private Facebook group for this particular theme of OCD um, and in the episode we believe it's called OCD staring. The exact name on Facebook is OCD peripheral staring backslash private staring um, but the link will be in the show notes of this episode um, but I'm sure if you typed in OCD staring on Facebook it will probably come up too. So thank you to both of them for their time and to you for listening and without further ado here is John and Sarah. On the podcast today I have Dr. Jonathan Grayson. John has been specializing in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder for more than 35 years and is the author of Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. He's on the podcast today to talk about a subtype called OCD staring and is joined by Sarah to share her experience. Uh, welcome back to the show, John, and welcome to the show, Sarah. A pleasure. Thank you. It's good to have you both here, and I think this is the first podcast I've done where I've had uh, a client and a therapist together. So, you know, it's a sign for all of us. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, John, what is OCD staring? OCD staring, it's, a, it's not as uncommon as people would think, but the basic problem is that people find, them staring, find themselves staring at people's genitals or private parts. No interest in sexuality, so this is not any relation to, I want to look. Uh, so they, and again, they might be a woman looking at a woman, woman looking at a man, it doesn't really matter. The key factor is they're doing something in that is going to get them in trouble. So they don't want to do it, and they find that their eyes keep going to those areas. Yeah. That, that is the core problem. It gets a little more complex from there. Um, I said, I, I had actually treated somebody over 25 years ago with it, uh, as far as I knew was a very rare problem. About 12 years ago on a blog I had, I had somebody with this problem write to me and I answered them. Mm. I had more hits on the last 12 years on that one subject than anything else because no one talks it and there was no place for these people to go. So it's not really uncommon. If you'd like to know how many people have it, no one knows. Mm. They just know that it's common enough. There's a, you know, there's on Facebook, there's a group of people with this problem. So it's more common than people realize. Yeah. A very unexplored problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Sarah, what what's your kind of journey or story with this subtype? Yeah, it started about thirty years ago, um, and I was sitting in a group of people, and I realized everyone was waiting for me to speak, and I suddenly didn't know where to look. And I think I contact with something I was always hyper aware of. That's something that made me a little bit anxious. Um, and then all of a sudden, I noticed that I was looking at someone inappropriately. And then all I could think about was that I could not do that again, or they might notice. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't stop doing that. And then I kept looking until people did notice. And you know, then of course I got very embarrassed. And it was, um, it was from that point, it just uh, got hold of me. And, and then there was nothing I could really seem to do. And it just seemed to get worse and worse from that point on. Um, I think. At first, I would have sort of a little panic attack when I was thinking I might do it, and then I would do it, and then, but it, it happened every few months, and and it wasn't that often, but then it just seemed to get worse and worse as time went on, and I am in a, in a constant state of anxiety now. 
whenever I leave the house. So afraid that I'm going to look at someone inappropriately, that they're going to notice something terrible is going to happen. It's going to make me very depressed. And so you get really caught up in your head. And then you have the experience that even when you're not staring at someone, you think you might be because you're not sure. And so then you do this whole process of checking. What are they saying? How are they looking at me? Um, are they, um, you know, can I, does this, what does this mean that they just said this or did this or their eyes went here or whatever? And so you become really engrossed in that. It's very, very difficult to say, go to work all day and sit there for eight hours and be in your head about how you're looking at people. Yeah. Um, cool. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and do you, was there any other sort of ever themes of OCD or was this kind of the core theme that came or subtype that came up for you? Um, this is really the, the main type for me. I think really I have more, it's more social anxiety hmm. and because it was always, I always felt like I didn't fit in and it was so important to me to fit in over the years. I think that's why this OCD had so much um, power yeah. is because it attacks your ability to fit in. And so other OCD things have come up in the past and I've just been like, no, that's ridiculous. I'm not going down that path. Mm. Like, I'm not gonna clean my house all day or I'm not gonna do this or that. Like, I'm sorry, OCD, I'm not, I'm not even gonna entertain that idea. But this one has been able to just really latch on to me. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I, I do have some sort of relationship OCD um, and, and that, but it's pretty minor, I think. Mm. I think a lot of people with this also do have social anxiety and as you know there's certainly a lot of manifestations of anxiety where people are become over concerned with the impact they're having on another and you know are they making a bad impression or whatever and you know OCD always kind of ramps up and finds the worst way to do it you know like if you you know again you may have some problem and it only gets worse if OCD comes up with oh you think that's bad how about this and this is almost I think at the bottom of the line you know mm -hmm. that uh, what if I'm staring at this? So the people yeah. have this, have a lot of trouble. And there there probably are, I think there's more than two groups. There are two obvious groups. You know, there is one group who actually doesn't stare, but they worry about it. But there is another group, they worry about it, and they do. And they know they do, not because they are sure they do, but they've been caught. Mm -hmm. People do things and they will lose friendships, you know. Uh, I had a letter from a mother. She lost all of her friends because they thought she was hitting on them. And you know, and like in all OCD, she has to explain. She doesn't really have to explain. But like, I'm not gay. I have no interest in them. I just love my husband. Yeah. I don't. I, nothing about them. But this is where her eyes would go. And so it becomes very difficult to interact socially. So if you have a little bit of social anxiety, well, this makes it worse because something is actually happening. You know, I always say that when we talk about sensory focused OCD where I'm worried about like noticing my breathing or obsessing about obsessing you know so they're, they're different than other forms in that your feared consequence comes true most of the time you don't cancer you know you know don't burn the house down but if you notice you know sensory focused life is horrible if I notice this well this is another one in which things come true people have lost jobs over this and the attempts to cope with it uh, they, they try to come up with things that frequently don't work. So some people will very rigidly try to stare at you and just give you eye contact, but they end up doing it in a way that looks odd. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the impression they make is like a little creepy, you know, or they'll try to just to stare at your ear, but it becomes obvious. There are a couple of different patterns as to when the staring takes place. So it's not just like, do they do it all the time? So, and again, none of this is research. It all needs to be researched because mm -hmm. it may not have implications for treatment but you know when we speak to another person when we are the speaker we often break eye contact to think we might look up we might look somewhere else so one subgroup of this I'm convinced that when they're the speaker when you know when they're not when they're thinking about something rather than looking up that's when their eyes go down they don't even know they're looking down but if you looked at them it looks like they're just staring at breasts or genitals mm -hmm. However, when we put this out online, uh, there are a lot of people said, nope, that's not when I do it. I do it when I'm the listener, you know, and of course, certain situations are worse. If you're in a group of like eight people, mm -hmm. well, now it's easy to not focus on the speaker. And so there are all these people around. So 
it becomes a very big problem for, you know, and, so, and some people, they basically stop going out. I mean, they stop because there's no way they can go out. Some people, you know, they will tell you, you know, my sunglasses, at least when I'm walking out in public, sunglasses are heaven because I don't have to worry about getting caught. Um, so it's very disruptive uh, because, again, if you're actually doing it, people get upset with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, like best case is like what happened to that woman is people just think you're into them. Like mm. that's not bad, but then it moves into like people starting to laugh at you and, and mock you and, and that just feels bad. But then uh, something I've noticed, especially over the last few years is people are more and more afraid of people with mental illnesses is with these mass shootings and things going on. There's so much prejudice against people with mental health issues that now it becomes this fear thing and people are really afraid if you're staring at them because they think mm. that you're hurt. There must be something, you must be some sort of deviance, something's wrong with you, you're dangerous. And I feel like that's really over the last few years become a problem for me. Yeah. Yeah, that I can imagine that that's tough given the current climate. Um, I, I can also kind of appreciate where like the OCD and the anxiety latches onto this, you know, if, do I self disclose it, you know, in my own life, if, if a woman has a low cut top on, for example, and I'm not, I'm not, um, let's say even sexually attracted to her, but it's, it's almost like I, I'm, not, I'm talking to her and I notice my eyes go down and then I have to like force them to stay up. And it's, it's not even, it's a unconscious, almost biological drive for my eyes to drop. And I spoke to my, um, wife about this and she said yeah i experienced the same if she's talking to a woman it's it's almost like it's a so i can see why it's naturally there like this unconscious biological urge to do that and then ocd will latch onto that and and that's where the kind of vicious cycle starts yeah right so, it, it's so many oc things where you know it is an exaggeration or something that mm -hmm. many other people will do you know that is embarrassing but it takes it to the next level Absolutely. because the frequency that um, uh, is totally interfering, you know. And so the person not only has to be getting caught, but you know, as you and you know Sarah said, all you know, anybody with OCD knows that however you look to the outside world, it, inside world is 24/7 thinking about it. So 24/7 being in terror the whole time I'm socially engaged and and trying to keep my eyes focused and you know what we don't have that kind of ability to even remember 24 7 so our eyes drift absolutely um and so because you mentioned sort of sense sensor sensory motor ocd or like uh, bodily sensations and and that can be called neutral obsessions so this would fall under that heading well i'm not sure i mean and, and just you know it, I used to call it neutral obsessions, then it became sensory focused obsessions. Now we call it hyper awareness, uh, all the same thing. Yeah. Um, and and the, the OCD problem with the eyes where it's peripheral staring, where I keep noticing the peripheral things in my vision and can't stand that. Mm. Although a lot of people with the staring will have that, they're kind of different to me because I know what to do for peripheral staring. You know, I mean, I know in a way that it may be hard for the person to follow through with treatment, but I know that we have a treatment that will work for that. This is dicier. Mm. You know, we need to do research on it. I mean, for one thing, obviously you can't do direct exposure, walk around staring at people's genitals. For many people, Sarah is one of them, if they, if they feel safe with the person, it doesn't occur. Mm. It's a, like judgment is the trigger and so if I'm in a situation where I'm feeling judged then it happens if I'm in a safe place then I'm fine and it and yeah. it, it, it's I can't I wish I could replicate that state when I'm in the like excited state or the nervous state but I, it's like I can't I can't reach back and like well how are my eyes then when I wasn't thinking about my eyes mm. and so so it can help in session like okay stare at my genitals you know, it'd be awkward and everything, but it wouldn't actually help. So we have a, a couple of, we have a couple, we, have, we do have some direct treatment and we have some coping. Like I said, people with this love their sunglasses. Mm. Um, 
at some point we try to work on how the person is interacting with people and what they need to be doing. Now, since the focus is constantly on don't look, don't look, don't look, one of the things we work on practicing, uh, I call sneak peek. You mentioned what happens if you are talking to a woman with a really low cut blouse. Mm. Basically, you're going to do sneak peek, which is, you know, you're going to basically try to look down there when she's not noticing. Um, so we will try to train people in that. That takes some of the pressure off because now it's not don't look. Now it's find the time to look. So that that is a partial thing. It, but again, you know, with OCD, so many times people want something to go away completely. Often we're talking about, no, we're talking about how are you going to cope with living with this? You know, now often coping means at some point it might stop bothering you. But as long as I'm waiting for it to stop bothering me, then I'm not really coping and I'm waiting for it to leave. And that doesn't work. So so sneak peek is a part of treatment. Um, we also had to teach people how to look at somebody because, again, you get so overly focused on your eyes. And some people have this as an OC problem separate from the staring. It's like they don't know what to look at when they're talking. Yeah. Now that's, their OC is like, I don't know what to do with my eyes. And of course, you know, if we talk about that long enough, everyone will become uncomfortable. Yeah. But um, so, so, you know, what we'll do is, okay, you can't just give this icy stare just looking into their eyes because after a while you look weird. And we can't say, okay, you know what? Look at their ear because that also begins to look weird. So we kind of do practice when a friend, I don't know if my friend made up the name for it. He told me about it, but we call it the three points there. I'm gonna have be looking at you and then purposely, you know, certain points like kind of look at three different places, like your ear, the top of your head and the other ear mm. and to practice that. Now that it's useful that we can have a partner to practice with, you know, just so they can look at you and say, yeah, that looks weird when you do it versus Okay, that doesn't look too weird when you're doing it, you know, but, you know, so in a sense, we're getting a, we're talking about doing a lot of um, trying to get them to, in a sense, to be very mindful of their eyes. And this is a really hard state to maintain because, I mean, we don't really ask anybody in any situation to be constantly mindful of X. You know, so this is, like, you know, in some sense, a flaw in the treatment. I, you know, I would use... You know, often with sensory focus OCD, I'll have a tape playing where it just reminds them of that issue. So I would have that playing here, even though it's, you know, kind of constant anyway. But I mean, that's that's kind of the treatment. It's very difficult. It's not enough. The, the other thing is we want to figure out what should the person tell someone else? You know, now, obviously, everybody would like to keep it secret. But we know it's not going to be secret we know you're getting caught up to now many people say well so i have to say i have ocd staring this is not a good thing to say and i think it's not a good thing to say because nobody knows what that means right the general public is like what is that and i think if you explain it to them and describe it as an ocd issue it's just words you know you're telling me you do this thing you're telling me it's ocd and like I don't think they get it at all. So what we've been telling the people to say, and again, not many people are brave enough to do this, but in some respects, what's the alternative? And it might be true, I'm not sure, um, is to tell them that it's a form of Tourette's. Now, I don't know if it's a form of Tourette's, but to say it's a form of Tourette's and, you know, kind of like, you know how some people do this weird cursing, this is my Tourette's thing, you know, and feel free to call me out on it. I feel like, more people will understand that. Now that kind of works. I can tell my friends that, you know, my friends, are like, oh, okay, weird, but like I can deal with it. Uh, you know, I was talking to Sarah about this earlier and she was pointing out, yeah, but that might not work for a job. Now, but you know, we still maybe have to tell the employer something because they're going to catch you. Yeah. You know, so you have this problem. Do I try to sneak through the job? I tell them after I'm hired, which, which, by the way, Sarah, might be a good idea because once I'm identified as a problem, it's an ADA issue. It's an ADA issue, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I want, and you know what? Then it probably would go away. Yeah, so that might be the future. But yeah, yeah. So, so that's. 
currently. Mm. Can I say in, in preparation for this? Um, I actually did have this conversation with three people, oh. and it was honestly the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. Yeah. And it, it took several conversations to kind of work up to it first, like, oh, you know, like, got this mental health issue. And the next time you see him, hey, yeah, you know, so it's uh, sort of this Tourette's thing. And the, you know, the next time it's like, yeah, you know, have you ever noticed, like, kind of look at people weird or sometimes? And so it was this long process. And I only told very, so far, just very safe people that I knew I was going to be okay. They weren't going to react badly. And actually, I had just really great responses and it feels so amazing to just have people in your corner it's like i've had this shame sack mm -hmm. on my shoulders for so long because i'm doing this thing that people react so badly to and just the idea that now i can sit across the table from like three different people and not have to worry where my eyes are and just have a conversation and not be in my head and not wonder why they're saying this or that or where they're looking or have they noticed is like just really amazing i would recommend that for anyone that has this problem tell safe people don't tell someone like just don't go up hey i know i'm gonna just go tell my boss you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> don't start off with that but um that's your 10 you know but it really has been a really good experience and i want to keep going with that and and just see how how that goes no, that's great I'm, I'm glad to hear that that was very helpful for you and you got the responses you wanted um so could working on say social anxiety be a indirect way to expose to this almost like Sarah was just saying that if you Sarah or you, you kind of build up by telling this that it's Tourette's for example at various places slowly working up that kind of hierarchy to my boss who I kind of like so to speak and you know and then I get a good response and then my anxiety lowers a bit socially maybe in within that circle is that am I well, I have two answers. Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason. Mm. Um, I have this concept that I describe as merged OCD. Right? Many people with OCD will have OCD and some other problem. Mm. Okay. Now, usually we choose to work on OCD first because that's interfering more with anything else. We have a subclass where OCD and the other problem will have the same feared consequences. So I'll give you an example to make it less confusing. Mm. So let's imagine two cases. Um, I have a person with really poor self-esteem and they have a contamination problem. Both really big problems, but they're not related. I help them with their poor self-esteem, they still have contamination. Now imagine I have a person with social anxiety and let's say the OCD staring. Here's what's going to happen. If I try to focus on social anxiety problems, they're going to get lost in the anxiety of the staring. That's going to be, that's going to be totally mm -hmm. controlled. If I try to focus totally on the staring, the social anxiety will come up. You know, or, or in a maybe different example, if that's not clear enough, imagine obsessive jealousy and somebody with borderline personality disorder in which the issue is I'm afraid of losing my relationships. You know, if it's just obsessive staring and, um, you know, again, they have terrible self-esteem, I can work directly on the jealousy, in which he's like, no, no, have them imagine their partner being with somebody else. But if they have borderline personality disorder and obsessive jealousy, if I treat the OCD, imagine your partner being with somebody else, I will send their borderline problems through the roof and they will have a great deal of difficulty. Mm -hmm. If I just work on the borderline problems, they will get caught in a loop of, did they do this, did they do that, and just go in that circle over and over. So I have to, in a way, do a very complicated, sloppy treatment of both of those problems. We could do a whole nother show on merged. Um, but but so, in case, so in this case though, right, if I just work on the social anxiety, that might be somewhat useful, but at the point somebody's coming in with this, it's so truly interfering. Yeah, it's over, you know, that, that's exactly what happened to me. 
is that I, I did really effective treatment on the social anxiety. And I don't even think people would think I have it anymore if they met me. Mm-hmm. I do things that I never thought I could do, like go to a restaurant by myself, and I don't even think about it anymore. But appear on the OCD stories. I was yeah. going to say that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that sent that did send the steering into overdrive. It took over the, all the space in my brain. Yeah. So yeah. so it's useful to deal with other issues always. Um, but often we have to deal with the OCD first because it's like dealing with somebody who has an alcohol problem. They may have other problems, but it's hard to work in them until they're sober. Yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, Sarah, so other than what John said, is there anything else that kind of helps you with with this, whether that's coping or whether that's you know, kind of making improvements on it? I think that the thing that's worked the best and it's hard to get into this mind space because when when bad things happen when people notice when they treat you badly you get very depressed you get very anxious but the thing that's ha- that's helped me is when i get into the mind space where i'm like i don't care what you think about me mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter to me and i can look at you any way i want to and then that reduces sort of the judgment anxiety and and then and then it's better yeah. i tend to not do it when i'm in that space but it's very difficult to get in that space because then your your brain's like, but you need this job, but you need yeah. these friends, you know, you know that, that kind of thing. And and I think that a lot of times when you when you go in for therapy, I think therapists underestimate the, the level of discrimination that happens when you when you do have this problem and how how much it really can affect your life. Because, you know, I've had like my mom hasn't talked to me since the nineties. You know, I, I've gotten fired from jobs, my kids have gotten rejected from play dates. Yeah. Uh, it's super intense the the side effects of it. so it's i think somehow you have to get over to the other side where you're like it just doesn't matter anymore yeah <clears throat> yeah and how you get there i'm not i'm not sure <laughs> it, it's very hard i mean the number of stories that i've heard because you know initially you hear it and, and the number of stories where people have been rejected you know by other people you know and lost friends and lost jobs mm-hmm. it's shockingly high i mean it's you know it's a direct effect of the symptom getting them you know having them lose those things you know and again and then the number of people who kind of isolate themselves and stay in which is Mm -hmm. scarier because i mean you know again from a treatment point of view i mean the initial goal was let's get them out in public wearing sunglasses you know when we talk about this doing the sneak peek um you know i have i have a number of clients who are so afraid of basically talking one-on-one, that's too much. So often what I'll have to, with them do as a pre-practice to go to a mall, sit down at a table and sneak peek people walking by. And that's a, that, and that, that is a hierarchy item for them. So like people walking by don't even know that they're being scanned or, you know, like the person's doing that, but that, that for some people is, oh, you know, as you can imagine, overwhelming, scary. So to get them out and, you know, functioning again, depending, because, you know, we have one group who has amazingly continued to function in some way and another group who has, you know, lost their functioning. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, so we, publicity is always helpful. Um, there's been a lot of excitement on the Facebook staring community just about this show, because yeah. both you and I know, like, we don't, you don't see this anywhere. Like, this is, you are the coming out party for this. You know, where yeah. I think I'm trying to do some little preliminary research, maybe presented IOCDF, but, but you are the coming out party. I'm on it. I'm on it. Uh, I, <laughs> that's been my last few months. I've been trying to cover themes and subtypes that just don't get any press. Um, whether that's because some of them are extremely taboo by nature in the content, in terms of the content, uh, and mm-hmm. others just maybe just no one's talked about it for whatever reason it baffles me why but um and i think often because people don't actually probably because people don't think it is ocd various things which is why then they don't get any press um Mm. so i'm i'm happy to contribute to to getting that ball rolling i guess um cool so uh i guess sarah what, what do you want people to know or others whether that's other people with OCD or other people with this particular subtype, what do you want them to know? 
I think uh, for people with this particular subtype, it's really important to find the right therapy because if you get the wrong therapy, it can actually set you back. Yeah. Uh, when I first started, I didn't even know that it was OCD. I didn't know what it was, but I was going to regular therapists talking about my social anxiety. And when I tried to bring up the stare, staring thing, they were actually just horrified. They're like, oh, I'm sure you don't do that kind of response, oh, which made me even feel more shameful and made me talk, less willing to talk to people about it. So I think you have to find an OCD therapist. And then you also have to find an OCD therapist who's going to believe you because of this whole subset of some people it's in their head and it's 100% in their head. There's this sort of I'm sure you don't actually stare, and if you do, it's not as bad as you think. And that is the response that you get, and you start feeling like you're in that Gaslight movie where you know, you're going crazy, but nobody will believe you. you know, and, it's, and so you really have to get somebody who's got your back, who understands that this is something that has a physical manifestation, and somebody that knows about the treatment options and isn't constantly trying to tell you that you know, it's in your head. Um, I think that probably would have helped me if I had found effective therapy 30 years ago. I don't think it would have become the pattern that it is now and it's become such a monster because it's gotten, you know, neural patterns now for so long, it's really hard to break. But I think yeah. if people get me quickly, which is another reason for doing the show, I hope people when they're doing internet searches will find this and say, oh, this is what I have and then go get therapy mm. instead of waiting for decades. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that sounds great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, also, and if there's OCD specialists that haven't come across this subtype yet, then they can show them this episode and they can, they, the therapist can learn. Um, and I have yeah. comments. Um, when I was actually talking to people and, and, hey, what happened in this situation? I think I stared at people. Did you notice that? I found out that it wasn't really my staring that was the problem. It was sometimes you're so afraid of, of staring that, like you said, you, you look at people kind of weird or you seem strange or you you become very antisocial. You don't make eye contact. You don't talk to people. You don't put yourself out there. And so you look weird because of that. And so the situation in which I thought, oh, I'm staring at everyone was actually I was they just thought I was like not a very friendly person and they just didn't like my personality because yeah. <laughs> I wasn't being myself because I was so afraid I was going to stare at someone. So I, I think, think that's something too for people that have this, we get so in our heads and we just think we're doing it all the time, is that sometimes we're not doing it, mm. but we're acting in a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of way. When you start acting antisocial and you start acting unfriendly and you're refusing to interact with people, it creates this like, well, people aren't going to be friendly to you. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind too. That yes, we stare sometimes, but we do. It's not we're not doing it 100 percent of the time. Yeah. We would think of how complicated that is for treatment. For Sarah, anytime people are reacting badly to her in the past, the assumption is I'm staring, and now the reality is, oh no, sometimes it's you're staring, and we have evidence of that from the people who called her on that. So it's mm -hmm. not like just like right. people treated her weird. You know, you're a weirdo, get away from me. And then there are other times it's like, oh, no, it's not the staring. You're acting like you're weird. Something's wrong with you. And, and to separate those two out. Now, one of the things she said that would be wonderful to work in the treatment, but not easy, you know, because in a way we do this with a lot of other forms of OCD. You know, it's when she can get kind of like angry up and sick of it, it's like, I don't really care what you think. But in a situation where I think bad things might really happen, mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit hard. You know, it's a, it's less of a what if low probability event. Uh, now, perhaps if we are working with people, you know, because, again, we don't have enough data. There is there is not collected data. But if we get enough people, you know, with the this is my form of Tourette saying it. So now they have a little bit of freedom, like, just call me on it. Like, I'm sorry, you know, and but but. Mm -hmm is now like I can have a, I can afford to have a little bit of that attitude because I warned you, giving you permission to say it, it might be more possible to get that, but it's a hard attitude, you know, it's hard to foster. I can foster it in other forms of OCD. You know, it always seems second best, you know, like, okay, I'm going to teach you to function while you're noticing your breathing all the time. But this, you know, this, this is a hard one, but yeah, so th those are among the goals. And um, again, it's, it's kind of an area where, refining treatment is desperately needed mm. cool well, yeah well hopefully uh we can inspire some research to be done um and yeah like you said maybe a, a talk from you at the next conference 
which we shared even more light. Um, so I've got a few more questions towards the end now, more generic uh, questions. So before we move on, is there anything else that I've missed you guys want to share on this topic? I think so. No? All good. For you, if you have anything. No worries. And uh, just to reiterate, there's the Facebook group if people want to, I guess, chat with others who, who go through this. Yeah. And that's just OCD staring on Facebook. Is that correct? I will. I will no. fact check that. <laughs> if it's in the comments. <laughs> yeah. If I haven't done a, an update at the start of this podcast, then that is the it's OCD staring on Facebook. Uh, okay. So um, just for, for both of you, uh, words of hope for those with OCD could be this theme, or it could be just OCD generally. Uh, I think that when I was younger, um, my, my biggest fear sort of all came true. And looking looking back, I really wish that I had been um, more of a fighter then. Like if I had started fighting this when I was 20, imagine the progress that, that I w would have made by now. And I'm just now doing it, you know, and I just really feel like I lost out on a lot the things that I really would have liked to do with my life because I allowed this to have control over me. So I, I think that would be my big message is like, start now, just yeah. start now, start finding it, start, you know? Yeah, absolutely. John. I have like a five minute. And <laughs> is that too long? Go for it. Um, Cause you know, I mean, I have two, two things. I mean, I think very often, Fighting OCD is as painful as having OCD, with the main difference being one is an end of rituals, the other is endless rituals. But um, a few years ago, a woman who let me talk about her came to treatment. She had OCD all of her life, and it really it was one of those forms where she would cope with it, and you know she made a lot of compromises, but she was okay with it. And the point she came to me, it had suddenly slammed into her and um, came in very depressed and she the form of OCD was she did not want any harm to come to other people and she was a fourth grade teacher mm -hmm. so it hit every way she was afraid she was a pedophile with the children she was afraid she was contaminating the children she was afraid that if the children's shoelace was untied if they fall it would be hurt if there's something on the floor it would be her fault if she kid you know shirt tail was out and it was her fault if they were going to get teased so it was just constant for her she, she was very depressed. I mean, we, we did have to have her go on an SSRI. Uh, she was also very tough. Because uh, I remember she, the things she did in the very first session, she had gone to the support group that night, and they went, they, you did what? So she was working really hard, and, and the meds kind of helped her. Um, you know, got her depression down. Wonderful principal at the school. He would help her contaminate, like have her touch the toilets and then touch the kids' seats. You know, but she was having a little bit of problems still with the idea of harming others. And uh, there was one day I said to her, you know, there's some kid in your class who has OCD and all the things the other teachers do with Purell and stuff are hurting that kid. And she began to cry because she knew exactly which kid it was. Mm. She was damned if she was going to do that. So from that point on, she really fought hard and overcame her OCD, and that is not why I'm telling you this story. She would say now that she has no regrets about having OCD. I mean, she is really happy to have it under control now and have her life, but she likes who she is. And she believes that if she didn't have OCD, she might be some other fine person, but she likes this person. You know, she feels like she's probably more empathetic because of it. And although she's not happy when she slips, she views them as practice. And so the message from her is, if you have OCD, you are not defective. You know, it might be a pain in the neck, but you're still a person. And if you're going to like yourself, you've learned something from this. I mean, granted, it'd be great if you didn't have to learn this way, but you might as well take the consolation prize because you're stuck with the OCD. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be my message. Having OCD doesn't make you any less of a person. And whoever you are at this point in time, 
it's part of what made you who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Good story. I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you both for those inspiring words. Um, okay, so question to you both. Um, you've both got a billboard where you guys are. Uh, what do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? And it could be anything that's written on this billboard. On the what? The billboard. Billboard. Yeah, sort of like your life in summary, your billboard. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, st- I took, stole something from my dad who was a Marine, but yeah, he told me the other day, he said, you know, life is a battle and we're on a suicide mission and all you can do is fight with valor. And I was like, okay, super fine. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> the toughest question. It is so hard, but... Um... Nothing is certain, so I'm always guessing. Yeah, I like it. Cool. So, firstly, well, actually, is there anything else that you wanted to share, either on this theme or just anything generally? Uh, now's the time to do so. You know, I can talk for five hours to it, but I think yeah. I think we got this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And Sarah, any last words or? Nope. Um, I'm sure I'll think of it right after we hang out, but. <laughs> oh, good. I think we're good. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for Sarah, you coming on and sharing your experience and, and wisdom for others who are experiencing this, and John, from your therapist point of view, thank you for going into it. So there have it. Thanks again to John and Sarah for their time and shedding light on this particular theme of OCD. And thank you to you for listening. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.